Welcome. Karibu. Thank you. Good afternoon. I must say honestly um, that uh, uh, an afternoon program, uh, I shouldn't be using this. Sorry. Okay, let me, let me use this one. An afternoon program is a challenge, not, not only to the listeners, also to the speaker as well. <laughs> so as, as you doze off and you sleep, just pray for me also that, because I also would like to sit there and sleep. <laughs> and the reason I will not sleep is because I'm speaking. Not because I'm strong, not because I'm spiritually strong than you are. It's just that I'm, 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 I'm speaking. If I were to sit there, I'll probably also doze off here and there. So when you find yourself sleeping, don't be hard on yourself and say, I'm a heathen, I'm a heathen. I shouldn't be sleeping in the church of God. <laughs> don't be hard on yourself. You are a human being who has just had a good lunch and uh, it's just a consequence of having good lunch and you just sleep. And it's so nice to sleep in the presence of God. You're taken care of. So I, don't, I know there are so many things we battle against in life. Sometimes we carry unnecessary burdens, you know. I, I told a story somewhere that I sometimes would wake up at night and I say, hey, I should be praying, I shouldn't be sleeping. So I start the prayer, but I never say amen because somewhere I fall asleep. <laughs> then I say, how can I be a pastor and I fall asleep? You know, you feel bad. Even to let members know that you do fall asleep, it's like you're not serious about life. But what's nice is that if I'm talking to my dad, which is my God, and I fall asleep on his lap, it's fine. It's okay. No parent gets angry at a child who comes to talk to him and then sleeps on his lap. How, how can you sleep? No. As long as I know that I'm sleeping in the embrace of the one who, who loves me. So don't be too hard on yourself. Afternoon, afternoon time is a very challenging time. Um, I will understand. But I must say, I appreciate your presence because we are human beings, my elders, even though at times when we are in the spirit, we say, even if there's one person, I don't care. I'll preach, but deep down in the heart, we care because... <laughs> You don't just want to talk to one person. It's good, it's good to, to at least get the feeling that at least people appreciate you know, what you're saying. I know we shouldn't carry that far, but I mean, I'm being vulnerable here. It's, uh, it's, it's good to see you. Um, the fact that you came after lunch and you, you drag yourself and you sit here and you drowse and you fall asleep, but you came, that shows that you are a hero. You are powerful. Uh, I could say, some of you are sleeping. You should have just stayed at home instead of sleeping. No, 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 no. It's good you came. It's good you came. You've done something better. I mean, that's strong to drag your sleeping body and bring it here. <laughs> it means your heart is here. Your heart is here. Things may overcome you, but your heart is here. And I think just for that, God is just, is just um, humanly speaking, is just so excited and would like to welcome you on behalf of God. I want to welcome you uh, this afternoon. What we're going to do for our camp meeting and I will encourage you to come with your friends so we can have this place full and we can enjoy ourselves. What we want to do this camp meeting time, um, we've already presented the topics to the committee. We, in the evening, what we're going to do, we're going to look at the book of Ephesians. We're not going to go verse by verse, you know, we only have one week. So, and I'm not even a scholar in the book of Ephesians, really. I'm just approaching it as a lay person, as you are. So, I don't have degrees on the book of Ephesians. But as students of the Bible, we're going to look at the book of Ephesians together, starting from tomorrow up until Sabbath, divine service. Just look at some important parts. There's going to be talking, we're also going to be talking about marriage, we also want to be talking about, about dating, those of you who are excited about dating. Um, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about parenting. We're going to talk about growing in Christ. Uh, actually, this, the, the, the summary of the evening messages is that you were once in darkness, now you are light, walk in the light. 
which is summed up in Ephesians 5 verse 8. So you were once there, you are here now, do. Which is a very powerful uh, presentation or, or depiction of the gospel. Once, now, therefore. Um, we'll be looking at that. It's going to be a very interesting journey that we're going to be undertaking together. I'm also excited that I'm going to be learning as I do that. Uh, then, during the day, during the day, and those of you who can rush for lunch and come, and then you go, we'll keep it within that lunch time if you can't make it, but you can just come for the service and then rush back. Uh, we're just going to be looking at the Old Testament figures, Old Testament people, and how they display grace, and how their life history, their experience, uh, help us to understand what grace is. So in every character, we look one or two things and see what can we glean from this uh, uh, concept of grace. Because sometimes we let grace, we, we think like we are dispens dispensationalists. In other words, we say in the Old Testament there was law, in the New Testament there's a new dispensation, there's grace. So we limit grace to New Testament. And say we are happy because we are living in the time of grace. Imagine those who were there, who were, were not living in the time, they were living in the time of the law. Hey, my friend, we're living in the time of grace, and it's also the time of the law, just as it was in the Garden of Eden. When God said to Adam, don't eat, that was the law. And when they ate, he says, I'm going to send my son to die for you. That was grace. There's always grace where there's law. So that uh, grace will give us the vitamin uh, for holiness and also grace will give us the assurance that God has not forsaken us throughout the Bible. So we'll then limit our reflection on the biblical characters on that uh, uh, Old Testament. Just pick up some few individuals and comment on others based on what we see, just to show that what we are saying about this individual is actually a biblical truth. It doesn't just pertain to him. He, he exhibits it in his story, but you can actually see it in the whole Bible. But we use him, his story, his life as an anchor to see what the Bible says about, about, the, grace of, of, about the grace of God. And during lunch, we were sharing with the elders some of the things that, so, so that they can give me permission to talk about those, some of the things that we will be talking about. And they think it's fine. I should go ahead. Uh, it's not dangerous. <laughs> it's not dangerous. But I must warn you, uh, I must warn you because my coming year, I'm not going to send the invoice to the the church in Lovington, they're not going to pay me for the hours I'm going to spend here. So I don't owe you any favors. I will say it as it is, and if it hurts you, sorry, but I'll say it again. And then if it hurts you again, I'll say sorry, but I'll say it again. So because after all, uh, they, the church bought the ticket. If they are unhappy with me Wednesday, they can buy another ticket and then I go home. I still have a home and they love me, at least my wife does. Uh, I'm not sure about the rest. So let me be honest, we will be challenging you. We will be challenging you and ch really challenging. We're not going to be like sweet, 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 uh, come to Jesus and all your problems will be over. Now, we will also say come to Jesus and that, was, that is going to be the beginning of your problems. And then we outline that you, because what kills us is to think that once we come to Jesus, it's time to sleep. No, once we come to Jesus, it's time to wake up from sleep. You were sleeping when you were away. Now you must be up because now the devil is going to be on your case. You must be vigilant. You don't have to be vigilant when you are walking with the devil. But once you walk with Christ, you've got to be, you must be sober. So we need to, to, be, to, be, to, be, to be strong because I, I've realized that our theology somehow is producing very weak Christians. We're producing very weak Christians who are so fragile. Just a person not greeting you, then you want to leave the church. We are so fragile, so fragile. <laughs> Pe people must tiptoe around you because he's going to leave the church all the time when there's a problem. Me, I'm going to leave the church. Oh, don't leave, don't leave. Come, give him some food so that he doesn't leave. <laughs> so we need, we need to be able to, to be strong enough that even when these things do happen, uh, we will not feel like this is the end of life. Are you happy with me when I do that? 
to give me the permission to do that. But please come. Don't just give me the permission and don't come. Because you must actually come feel it. Uh, and, uh, but of course, there will be comfort as well. Because the things we share here are also a challenge to the speakers as well. And other speakers are going to be here. It's a challenge also to us. God does not call or instruct angels to come and talk to us. God does not, does, does, has not commanded angels to do the preaching. You know why? Because when angels speak, they just say, I don't know what's wrong with you. Because as far as they are concerned, this thing is easy. Just love people, okay? Just love them. Forgive. What's wrong with you? Just forgive. It's easy for angels. Oh, but for us, it's, it's, it's a struggle. So God says, you who, who think it's easy, you can sit down and encourage this one. I want you who is struggling with this thing. I want you to come here and tell them that it should be done. So you see, God picks preachers so that they can journey with you through their own struggles as, all, as, as well. So we don't stand here because we have made it. We stand here because we must make it, and by sharing it with you, we make sure that we're going to make it. I often say to my wife, when we come from a life seminar, a life, life manage, a family life seminar, I say, hey, but we, hey, we are good at this thing, man. We are good at this thing. But it becomes difficult now after we present it, you know, because now we must practice it. <laughs> So I say, I remember I was saying there in that seminar that, you know, when you're angry, you must lower your tone and, 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 and don't, don't, don't think a raised tone is a good argument. You don't use tone as part of argument, you know. So I remember that. But now I'm raising my tone. Then I remember. Then she's looking at me as if she's reminding me. Then I say, ah, 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 but no, it's not fair. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like I have a reason to do this. I'm trying to rationalize. So, so when we stand here, we are also trying to say, listen, we are also beggars, but we found help somewhere. Go get help also there. It's going to help you. Are you with me? So we're not standing here because we've made it. We're not standing here because we're angels. We are not. Uh, but we're standing here because we are fellow, fellow sojourners. We come from the pews. We stand here. We go back to the pews. We don't come from heaven and then go to heaven. We come there, we stand here, we go back. <laughs> Amen? So I hope then you will take it in that light because sometimes where our weaknesses are, that's where we are strong even in our preaching. I'm not going to repeat that. All right. So because now you're going to think hard and say, oh, now I understand. <laughs> so let me leave you there before you think hard. So what we're going to do this afternoon we're going to, thank you, sir. What are we going to do this afternoon? It's just my pulpit is too far from you, and uh, so I'll keep coming close if you don't mind. So what, what we're going to do this, 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 this afternoon, um, I'm looking at my time. What are we going to do this afternoon? I want us to just go through Romans 8. We're not going to make it boring because it's afternoon. But the reason I'm bringing Romans 8 is because I realize that throughout the week there are some aspects, there are some other areas I would not be able to cover because they are not in the book of Ephesians. So I don't want to bring things that are alien, that are not there. I don't want us to be, to be, to be, to be more clever than the Ephesians, get more information than they got. So let's stay with what they were given by Paul. But then, then because we're going to do that and there are those areas that are not covered, then probably we will touch those in the book of Romans, all right? Uh, and the reason we're focusing on Ephesians is because our theme speaks more uh, closely to that Ephesian concept because we are saved. You have, you have been saved by grace and that not of your works, lest any man should boast. So we, we, we use that theme in the book of Ephesians and then we, we extend it throughout the book. Also, I'm not going to say much on the introduction to the book of the Romans uh, as if you're having a study. But... I'm going to introduce this by saying one of the, okay, let me, read, let me read a text. Let me tell you what we're going to do. We're going to look at the consequence of being saved by grace. So you see, we are saved by grace. It's like it has happened. Now, because it has happened, what does, what's the implication? What does that mean going forward? That's, that's what I'm going to be doing. We will do that also during the week within the Ephesians context. But how does, how does that translate. And in one word, and we will explain it, 
in one uh, uh, concept, Paul says in Romans 8, because that's where we're going to focus, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And I want you to put a full stop there, because truly there's a full stop there, except that there's this explanation to make that, but there's a full stop. That full stop is very important. Don't add anything. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. What we are saying is, what we are saying is, if we have been saved by grace, the consequence of that is that now we are under no condemnation. We are not condemned. That's very important because some of us, even though we have been saved by grace, still go around carrying guilt feelings of being condemned. We feel condemned. Yes, you hear that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, and you believe you are in Christ, but you go around carrying a heavy burden of condemnation. You feel you are condemned. And I'm going to tell you for, for good reason why you feel condemned. It is because you are in Christ. I'm going to make some radical statements here. Because you are in Christ, you know you are in Christ, you know that you are baptized, you know that you are a member of the church, you know that you are the superintendent, you know that you are the pre preacher, you are the deacon, you are in Christ, in the books of the church, you are baptized, and yet, last week, Thursday, you committed sin. Now you feel, therefore, that you should be under condemnation. But that text says, if you are in Christ, and this is what the devil doesn't want us to know, especially Adventists. If you are in Christ, it doesn't say if you are in Christ and you don't fall. You are under no condemnation. That statement is full on its own. It says if you are in Christ, you are under no condemnation. Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean from time to time you're not going to fall. It says even when that happens, you are under no condemnation. Now, that's the gospel, and you will still unpack it. It's very important to get that in mind because what usually happens is because I am in Christ and I blundered, so I condemn myself to a point where I don't even want to go to church because I feel like I'm in embarrassment. I even want to leave home. I even want to stop everything because I'm in, I'm in embarrassment. How could I do this when I know so much? But the text says you are under no condemnation. But who says to you you are under condemnation? It's the devil. So the devil says the moment he picks you and leads you to temptation and you fall, he whispers in your ears. He says, La, you thought you could make it. I told you even from the day you started that when your type does not make it. You see, your mother was just like you. Your father, you remember your father. You are just like your father. Even though you think you are baptized, you are an Adventist, you are a Christian, you are just like your father. What are you going to do? Just exactly what your father did. It's in your genes. You can't run away from it. You are condemned. Just give up. And people can write a whole book on why they think they should give up. Because they are listening to the evil one. Now here's a message that I want us to look at briefly. And that is those who are in Christ. So the question you should ask is, Yes, I've blundered. Yes, I've made a mistake. Yes, I've fallen. But then, then if you come to me for counseling, say, Pastor, I've made this mistake. I've done this. Then my question is going to be, are you in Christ? Then, then I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, uh, I was in Christ. Um, I was in Christ. But now I'm no longer sure. Then I ask you, why are you not sure? You say, Judging by what I have done, I don't think I am in Christ. Then my question is, so what do you understand by this expression, those in Christ? Which means your theology is not very strong. Your understanding of what it means to be in Christ is not very strong. So we're going to make it strong today. And when people ask Adventists, they ask us, you ask other Christians as well, are you saved? It's a difficult question to answer. And yet your theme says saved by grace. <laughs> then as you leave the church, I ask you, are you saved? Pastor, I mean, we just spent the whole hour telling you are saved by grace. Are you saved? Hey, Pastor, you never know. What are we doing here? You bring the whole speaker from South Africa to remind you that you are saved, but still, you're still not sure that you are saved. All right. Now, let's, let's quickly then 
let's quickly then agree on the following. Um, okay, one of the reasons, therefore, one of the reasons why some of us will not give themselves to Christ, I'm going to make this more like a lesson that we don't, we don't have another sermon immediately after the other one. Uh, one of the reasons why some of us will not commit themselves to Christ, it is because we have seen people who committed themselves to Christ, but we have made blunders. Then you say, you know what? I'm going to wait until I can enjoy sin to a point where I'm fine. Fine, 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 fine. I no longer want to enjoy sin now. I've eaten, 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 eaten. Now I'm good. Now, elder, I want to be baptized. So I think I, I can do it. Because then you are saying, I don't want to be a hypocrite. You mean, I don't want to be like others. When I do things, I want to be a good Christian. I don't want to be a hypocrite. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to clean myself when I'm clean, and then I'm going to ask Christ to accept me. But why are you going to Christ when you have cleaned yourself? Because he says, I'm going to clean you. So if you're already clean, what are you doing there? He says, I've not come for the, for the what? For those who are well. I've come for those who are sick. I've come for sinners, not for the righteous. So don't, come, don't go to Christ if you are okay. Because you are going to be a burden. People who are a burden are those who are fine. Because they keep looking there with Christ and say, Christ, do you see that one also? I think that one is hopeless. So you're sitting there. And, and the, the word for that that is used in the Bible is do not judge others. So when you think you are okay on your own, you end up being a judge with Christ and say, hey, I, it looks like I'm going to be the only one in this church. Who's going to make it? I thought the elder was going to join me, but after what I heard, <laughs> I'm the only one who's going to make it. I, 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 I had a, a brother confront me. I promise you, there are many times when we get those confrontations. Confront me just there as we were greeting outside. Pastor, I want to talk to you. I thought he was going to say, Pastor, I, your someone touched me. So, <laughs> so he says, I disagree with what you said in the in the. I said, but I don't know what you believe, so I don't even know what you're saying. Sometimes I also disagree with what I said, so. <laughs> then he says, when you said, because uh, I was talking about Lord's Prayer, he said, Lord, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. He says, I have not sinned. I can't remember when last I sinned. I said, then that's your problem. Keep it with you, that's your problem. It's not mine. He says, no, but you said we must ask for forgiveness. I said, it's in the prayer. It's in the prayer. It says, forgive us our sins. And I was just saying that. If you have no sins, don't have to worry. Just pray for us so that the Lord may forgive our sins. Then I asked him the question, that, the answer that he gave me without asking him. He says, I've never sinned. I haven't sinned since I was whatever. I can't remember. Then I said, you know what? I've heard such things. I wish I could ask your wife. I might get a different story. You know, some of us are so righteous that we don't even see when we are wicked. And the wife will say, Pastor, I won't say it in front of him. He thinks it's okay. I'll tell you when we are alone that this one here is hopeless. <laughs> so stop looking at the mirror and, and give yourself 100, 100 marks. Ask others who stay with you. And you'll be surprised. Say, how, how do I portray myself? I, I, don't do that. It's dangerous. But you, you ask others, they will... They will tell you, especially if they love you and they're not afraid of you, they will tell you how, how you feel. So once we understand this concept of in Christ, in my mind, it gives us the assurance of salvation. We don't want Christians who say, I am fine, I am fine, I am fine, I am fine, trembling. I am fine, I am fine, I am fine. I ate between the meal, between the meals. Yo, now I'm condemned. So, so you go, and then, then you eat between meals. I'm, you, know, you know I'm trying to make a, a statement here. You eat between the meals, and then you are knocked by a car, and you die. Then we say, Phew. and he had an apple in his mouth, and, and that was between the meals. I wonder if he's going to be saved when Jesus Christ comes. Oh, nobody thinks like that. But you get my point. So that the, the saved by grace can be offset by eating an apple in between. And it can be that, it can be that um, neurotic for, especially for some of us who um, have been brought in the church. You know what I mean? It can be, it can be, it can be, it can be that, at that point. I know of people who, <laughs> I know of people who, Pastor, we are fighting with my husband. We are fighting with my husband. Um, my husband is a vegan, like vegan, 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 truly vegan. 
And me, I want to be a vegan also. But I'm struggling with certain things, so I eat eggs from time to time. And my, my, my husband doesn't even want to share the bed with me, doesn't want to do anything. You're not a vegan. I'm a, I'm a vegan. You're not a vegan, and, and, and you are contaminating me. He said, this is, this is not right. I mean, how do you say that to a person you're married and you speak like that? You know, now your, your, your wife or your partner, is, his value or her value is, is, is determined by how, whether he eats eggs or not. Oh, no, that, but that's not fair. So the poor, the poor person now is going to pretend as if she doesn't eat that and wait until you are gone and then she starts eating. And then when you are there, she's there, she's there I've got a powerful wife. <laughs> you don't know anything. <laughs> you just make people to be hypocrites. And, and in a relationship like that, it can be very, very difficult. Now, here's the thing, beloved. According to Romans 8, if you are in Christ, it means you do not you are walking in the spirit. Now, but putting those two things, you walk in other words, you are led by the spirit. The spirit is directing you. You are guided by the spirit when you are in Christ. But it doesn't mean that the, the spirit must first be in you and guide you. They are going to be in Christ. It happens when you are in Christ, when you are baptized and we say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, when we stretch our hands, we are actually asking God to pour his spirit on you so that as you come out of that water, symbolically, as you come out of that water, you come up in the newness of life and led by the Holy Spirit because you are his. You are in Christ. This is very important that the status is very important before the empowerment. You are um, Powered by the Holy Spirit because you are, a, you have a different status and then you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. All right? And I'm going to make it very clear, but I just want to follow the, the, the passage so that I don't jump uh, up and down. And then it goes on to say, Christ has actually died for us so that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Here's another story, and we want to come back and explain it. That when Christ died, he died so that the righteous requirement, in other words, obedience, can be fulfilled in us. This is very interesting. When Christ, who was sinless, he died for us. And when you are in him, what it actually means is the righteousness, the requirement of the law are fulfilled in you. In other words, now the obedience of Christ is actually now placed to your credit. What Christ accomplished in his life when he was obedient and he never sinned is actually deposited into your account. So when you start your life as a Christian, you start with a perfect account of perfect righteousness. You are in Christ. You have not even been faithful to church. You have not even returned tithe. But you're starting that, and we're going to say more about that during the week. You're starting that whole life with righteousness deposited into your account. You are in Christ. And then you are walking because you are in Christ. So he says, so that the righteousness of the law might be, might be fulfilled in us. And that fulfilled in us was actually the basis of, it was actually uh, uh, the the, the the accomplishment or what Christ accomplished on the cross for us. All right, then we go on and we say, you see, the thing is people who are in Christ, that's verse 8, verse 6 to 8. People who are in Christ are not carnal because people who are carnal cannot keep the law. So those who are in Christ are able to keep the law because they are not carnal. But listen very carefully. Follow the progression. It doesn't say when you keep the law, you will stop being carnal. It says when you, when you are spiritual, you will keep the law. So the law is spiritual. It can only be kept by those who are spiritual. If you are carnal, then in your mind, the law is enmity. It says that the law of God is enmity. You are a stranger to God's requirements. You are a stranger to righteousness. Now here's the thing. Even if you keep the Sabbath, if you are carnal, it is a carnal mind who is keeping the Sabbath. And in Ephesians, he puts it nicely, says, you are darkness. You are darkness whether you are in the light. You don't become light because you are, you are, you don't become light because you are in the light. You can be darkness in the light. In other words, you carry yourself where you go. You don't change because the environment has changed. 
If you are the son of Christ, you carry yourself less. You are the son of Christ. You don't become the son of Christ because now you are not smoking. Others, all the dogs that don't smoke will become the son of Christ. So we can't, we can't then look at your behavior and then infer from your behavior that you must be the son of Christ because you are not smoking. Now, no smoking is good. It, 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 it may help you, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're the son of Christ. But when you are the son of Christ and you say, because I'm the son of Christ, I don't want to smoke because I've never seen Christ, my father, smoke. You know, when you are a son, you want to behave like your father. So you say, I don't want to smoke because I belong to my father. You don't say, I want to belong to my father, therefore I'll stop smoking. Does this make a difference? So, so, so the motivation to stop smoking doesn't come from the fact that I want to belong. It comes from the fact that I belong. I belong. I'm here. I belong. Now, here's the thing. So when you fall and you find yourself smoking again, does it mean you don't belong? No. It means I belong, but now I've, I've disappointed my father. He's still your father, but you've disappointed him. So what must you do? Ask for forgiveness from him because they've disappointed him. So the, the ability to ask for forgiveness comes from those who recognize that their status does not change even when they've made a mistake. Okay, let me say that again. The reason why we confess it is because we, ask, we, we, we believe that our status was not altered by the behavior. If my son does something wrong that he knows he's not supposed to do, my son, and says to me, Daddy, what I did was wrong. He is the only one who has the right to come to me when he's done something wrong. You know why? Because he's my son. But I don't expect you, my sister, to say, Pastor, then I say, hi, I did something. I said, but why are you telling me that? <laughs> I mean, I'm not your father. I mean, of course, you could be saying that because I'm the pastor, I wanted me to pray for it, but, but I understand. But not because there's a relationship. So you, you do not, the confession is for those who recognize that they are in Christ and they've done something wrong that is against Christ. They, those confess because they are in Christ. It is because you realize and you recognize that your status is still intact even though you may have done something wrong, but your status is still intact. And that's very important. Of course, some people will argue and say, what happens, Pastor, if you die in that condition? Okay, let me answer that question. Let's say, let's talk about, about those who are married, because marriage is a way of really testing your Christianity. <laughs> especially if you've been married long enough. The first two years, the first two years is nice because you're still in love. Wait until you're out of love but in marriage now. <laughs> it's a different story. It's a different story. So let's, let's assume that uh, you picked up a quarrel. It, it comes quickly, by the way, in marriage. It comes quickly. That you don't see it coming. It's like, boom, it's here. So as so you pick up a quarrel, you pick up a quarrel and, of course, it doesn't happen to me because I'm a pastor. You pick up a quarrel. <laughs> you pick up a quarrel and uh, you feel like, no, 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 I'm staying with this quarrel. You know, I'm just, I'm not letting this thing go. I know it's not very right, but I'm not letting it go. I'm staying with it. I'm going to milk it for what it's worth. And then you stay with it. And then, listen to me, then you hit by a heart attack and you die. It happens in life. It does. Boom, gone, finish. I'm asking you. What will happen to you when Christ comes? Will you be saved? Remember, you said you are saved by grace, but you will be saved. There's no one saved, always saved here. Will you be saved? Remember, you were not in a good. That's why the Bible says, don't let the sun. Yeah, because we never know what happens before the sun sets. All right, so, so what happens now? Here's my answer. It could be a wrong one. It could be a wrong one. Uh, but think about it. Here's my answer. We, our salvation is not determined by, 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 by the point we, we, we are when we die. That does not determine our salvation. Our salvation is determined by, by our attitude. It is determined by our graph. It is determined by where were you going when you died. Not where you were. You know, falling is where you were, but where were you going when you fell? That's what determines your salvation. So even though you may have died without dealing with that, this is me now talking, and I'll come back to that and I'll support it. You may have died without dealing with that, but if you had given enough time, you would have dealt with both you. You were going there, 
You were, you were going. <clears throat> you are not judged. You see, <laughs> character is not judged by misdeeds or occasional good deeds, but the trend of life. Ellen Dwyer says, the trend. If the graph is still going there, yes, but there's a dip, but it's going. Have you seen those graphs? It's not like it's a free fall. Boo. No, it's not a boom. Given enough time, the thing goes up again. But, but you see, it's going. It's, that's, that's what actually determines. Because when you wake up in heaven, sorry, when you wake up. <laughs> okay, when you wake up and Jesus Christ is coming, and, 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 and you wake up, um, if you had, okay, let me, let, me, let me give you another scenario. So let's say now you had just preached a good sermon, and then on your way out you die. We will all say at Lovington, oh, what a way to die. <laughs> After a sermon. You can tell that he knew that he was going to die. In his sermon. <laughs> I mean, people are reading all kinds of things. I remember while he looked at me like this. <laughs> and I could tell this could be the last one. I mean, <laughs> so now he's dead. So we all push him to heaven. But you know what? That person may have been preaching, and that was his last sermon, but he's been going away from Christ, even in his last sermon. He had turned his back, he was going away. Do you know that the, when people go out of the church and not come back, that's not the event, it's, it's the culmination of a process. They have been moving away even when they were singing in the choir. They were, they've been moving, but you don't see they've been moving away. But but now you see them sitting in the, in the whatever, doing whatever. Then you say, oh, it has started. No, 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 no. It has been coming. Now, here's the thing. For fairness, for fairness, you should go where you were headed before you die. Not where you were. Does that make sense? If you were going, because it's going to be unfair if a person had made an agreement is going to hell and then, then is sent to heaven. He's going to say, I, I, this is not where I wanted to be. Sorry. And I will make that point again that grace saves us from being taken to heaven without our willingness. Grace saves you. If God was cruel, he would let you go to heaven. You know how to punish a person who's naughty? Take him to church. And you say, you're going to sit there, we're going to be singing the Advent hymn. No more gom, gom, gom. Advent him from 9 o'clock until 6. You don't move. He wants to go drink alcohol. He wants to go smoke his thing. We are not smoking. We're drinking water. <laughs> By the time his son said he will want to commit suicide, it will be like hell. When you are in, in the environment of holiness and you are actually opposed to it, it becomes hell. So one way of punishing a person is to take him to a place he doesn't want to be and make him stay there. If God wanted to punish us, he would take us to heaven. Hey, yo. Imagine forever. You want to steal, you can't steal forever. <laughs> you want to gossip, you can't gossip forever. It's like it's here. You want to do it. You want to do it, but it's like you go to the angel. Hey. You want to, the angel says, what are you saying, eh? What are you saying? <laughs> then you say, ah, shh, shh. Then you want to go to this one, he says, say it, speak, speak loud, speak loud. Then you say, where do I go now? <laughs> you look at your watch, they say, don't even look at your watch, it doesn't make any difference, it's forever. <laughs> We're going to be here forever. So you are going to be in that pain of wanting to gossip forever, and you'll never find anyone to gossip with. Then you will say, like those people in the time of Noah, please let me go out of here. Of course, they didn't, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. But that would have been the next chapter if it was written. In other words, if Noah had opened the door to those guys who said, Noah, Noah, open the door. We want to come in. But Noah says, I didn't close it. How can I open it? I might talk to whoever closed it to open it. We want to come in. I'm your uncle. Those people all knew each other there. It was like they were strangers. Uncle, that, I'm your uncle. Hey, hey, open this door. And, like you try to threaten and then you try to bargain and all kinds of things. But the water is coming like, hey, open the door. All right? Then you feel like, let me open the door. Then you open the door. Then you get your uncles in and your aunts and everybody can say, Qu quickly, quickly, before the water comes in. They say, thank you. Then you close the door. And then they say, phew, we nearly died there. So they are getting there. They're getting warm. 
They said, where's fire? And they're getting warm. Then they're nice and they're warm and they're nice. Now one starts by saying, what are these animals doing here? Now you can only notice that. You can only notice that now because you are beca- you're becoming comfortable. Then he says, hey, and it is smelling here. Shah. Now you've forgotten about the fact that you were dying. Then you begin to complain about the animals. Complain about this. It's stuffy here. You don't care how stuffy it is. Can you believe what I'm trying to say? It can be stuffy in the church. It's worse outside. I'll stay here even though it's stuffy. It's stuffy. I'm going where? It's like being in the plane and it hits the, what do you call that thing? The table. I'm getting out of this plane. Sure. When it hits the turbulence, you tighten the belt, so I'm not going anywhere. So when your church goes through turbulence, look for a belt. (laughs) I'm not going anywhere. (laughs) All right, when when we face, when, when we face, when we face, when we face those challenges, then we need to remember that uh, this is what happens to those who are in Christ. Now I'm going to say to you now that those in Christ, let's, 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 let's recap. Those in Christ are those who don't walk in the flesh because the spirit dwells in them. Those in Christ, I'm just going through the chapter, the passage. Those in Christ are the sons through the spirit. They are the sons. It says in 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's verse 16. We are the heirs of, of, of God, and we are the joint heirs with Christ. That's how serious this sonship is, that we are actually inheriting the whole kingdom. We, we are, later on you will see there's going to be core ruling and core kingship. So we are the heirs with Christ. This is how serious this thing is. We have that status. But remember, this is not something that you have when you're in heaven. It is something you have here in Lovington. I'm the joint heir with Christ. I'm the child of God. I'm going to say this again. I know at the the risk of repeating myself, when you make a blunder, you must say the child of God has made a blunder. Don't say the child of the devil has made a blunder. Because the child of the devil does not make a blunder. He's a blunder. (laughs) If you make a blunder, if you make a blunder, that means you've done something that that is opposed to your status. That is why you can even qualify it as a blunder. Are you with me? If you say, I have committed sin, that means you have done something that is against who you are. That's why you can phrase it as sin. Because those who are in sin do not commit sin. They don't. It's like saying, I have fallen. It means you are walking. Because people who are fallen don't fall. So when you say, I am fallen, you are actually saying, I was walking. So therefore, you can walk again because you are walking. So, so you can't, because you have fallen, even begin to doubt that you are walking. You see, this is what people do. Just because I am fallen, then they say, ha, ah, me, I knew. <laughs> that, that one is fake. How do you know? Because he's fallen now, then you say he was fake. Then go read the story of Peter. Peter walked on the water. That was not fake. If you think it was fake, go and walk and see what's going to happen. So Peter walked really on the water. The disciples remained on the boat. You know what? On that night, there's only one person who fell into the water. Do you know what was his name? My chorister? His name was Peter. Do you know why Peter fell? You can say whatever I want to say, but here's the truth of the matter. He was walking on the water. Now, now, those in the boat did not fall. You know why they did not fall? Yeah! Yeah! That's why you did not walk. You're not, walk. You did not fall. You're not walking. You see, people who boast to us of not falling, it's because they're fallen. People who are sleeping don't fall. Well, unless it's whatever, they didn't fall on the bed. But people who are, f- who are sleeping don't fall because they're already what? Sleeping! And people, I'm trying to, especially to our young people. I mean, there are young people, you look up, up to them and you see them, they're doing so well. And then, boom, she's pregnant. Now, pregnancy is not a boom. <laughs> but I'm just saying boom in the sense by that we see, are you with me? So, so we see, and then, and then, and then people say, sure. Yeah. There was nothing there. No, there was something. There was something. Don't even think you're in his league. When you don't even qualify to fall. You know, there are people, there are people who fail. You can't fail if you did not sit for the exam. 
Now, you can't sit for the exam if you don't qualify to sit for the exam. So failing is actually success because people who, I'm true, this is true, people who fail are actually enrolled at the university. You can't laugh at me and say, I hear you failed your mess, but and then I goes, did you write it? <laughs> so at least I wrote and have experience of going through it. When you didn't even qualify to write, you didn't qualify to write. So me, at least I qualified to write and I failed. There's hope for me. But for you, you still have a long way to go before you can even fail. <laughs> We've got to be able to speak these things to us when we're going through difficulties. You must have that small voice that in spite of the fact that my heart is broken, I I'm disappointed, I'm embarrassed by what I've done, but there must be a voice that says, yes, I may be down now. Yes, I may be heartbroken now, but I still belong to Jesus. You can't, you can't that voice die. Sometimes that voice doesn't come from the pulpit. You don't hear it from the pulpit. You go there hoping you'll get some voice, encouragement and the pulpit says, and you think you are a Christian. So and then you say, oh man. Then you even, you are Western when you came in. So you walk in hopeful expectation then you're going home like, why? It's hey. Hi, the pastor is right. <laughs> I'm useless. <laughs> I mean, the sermon was just unpacking how useless you are. I'm saying in spite of that. And sometimes parents get so discouraged also, and they say, what, what's, what's the name? What's the uh, Kenyan name? Okay, let me give you our home name. Nomsa. You are, a dis you, are a you are a disgrace. Do you know this person who says you are a disgrace? Never say to you are a disgrace. There was ne I'm serious, that people who are quick to call you a disgrace, when you are a grace, they don't say it. They just say, huh, 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 we'll see, huh. It's like they're hoping and waiting and praying that it should be a disgrace. And then they said, you, I never even thought you would even. I'm even surprised how far you have walked. Now, our parents can be disappointed at us and say things they don't mean. And those things can shape you for the rest of your life. I mean, I don't need to tell you that, you know, those of you who are into psychology and other things, that some of us are carrying loads and burdens from what our parents told us. Now, listen, you've got to listen to what God says to you. He says, you are now in Christ, and now, okay, 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 I've blundered, I've made a mistake, but am I still in Christ? Yes. How do I know that? Because what I have done makes me uncomfortable. Because those who are not in Christ, when they do these things, they even boast. You know what I did yesterday? <laughs> Just that, that's where they are. But you don't. When you meet the elder, you say, hi, elder. And you say, it's like he knows. You know, it's like the way he looked at me, I think he knows. And the reason you are uncomfortable, it is because you have done something that is against who you are. Now, I'm saying this, beloved. I'm saying this because... We've had to bury young people who committed suicide because they were disappointed at what they've done. Say, so I'm hopeless. I'll never amount to anything. The best thing is for me to die. You know who says that to you? It's the devil. There's no parent who, well, a good parent, I would say, because you never know with the, with the parents of today, but there's no good parent who destroys the child who was trying to walk because he has fallen while trying to walk. We, we keep saying, come, come to mommy. Come to daddy. Not to mommy. Come to daddy. Come, <laughs> come to daddy. And, and, and you know what, what happens is that, I mean, you know with, 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 with a child, uh, you don't always see those developments at the same time. It's like the mommy, mommy sees it. says, you know that? You know that this child can walk? I said, nah, not this one. It's just like you will never be able to walk. He says, this child walks. So, this is okay. Show, show daddy, show daddy that they can walk. Stand up. You know how kids are, they're not going to be walking now. Come on, man, you walk, show daddy. He said, ah, that's a lie. Do you know, the person who saw that child walk knows the child can walk. Even though now he's seated, he's not doing anything. You say, I saw him walk. He can walk. Let me tell you what God says to you when you are refusing to walk. He says to the angels, 
he can walk. And they say, huh? And they say, the devil says, that's what we never says, he can walk. He walked. He can walk. You will see. Come, show him. Show him. He can walk because he walked. When Peter started sinking and Christ lifted him up, and people don't tell you that story because they are hypocrites. And the story is he walked back to the boat. Nobody says that. It's like, ah, that one fell. That's not the end of the story. <laughs> don't end on the fall because it says, and then she says, Christ, save me. And then he pulled him up and the Bible says, and together they walked back to the boat. If you once walked, there's always a possibility that you can walk again. All right? So let's never give up on ourselves. Let's never even give up on our friends, on our colleagues, on our, on our fellow members. Here's something which is very interesting also that I must share with you. And that is in verse 18, it says, for, okay, let me, let me make a statement first before I read the text. When you are in Christ, it doesn't mean you will not suffer. Because he says in verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings, the sufferings, is not one suffering, the sufferings. <laughs> Remember, he's talking to those who are in crisis, the sufferings. How many sufferings have you had, my brother? So people say, if I go through sufferings, that's verse 18, it says, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, not to us. To me, that's very important. So, so here's, the, here's the story. We think if you are suffering, God is punishing you for something you've done. In other words, you are not in Christ. If you were in Christ, you wouldn't be suffering. Now, there are people who are selling that gospel. That the reason you, have, you are not employed, you have not enough faith, you don't believe. If you could believe, <laughs> you would never be out of employment. And then you sit there and you say, Yo, now you, you are not employed. Then you blame yourself for not being employed. It's because of me. It's because uh, uh, it's the economy. It has nothing to do with you. It's because of me. It's because of me that I'm employed. It's because of me. I'm useless. I'm hopeless. And God is punishing me. I remember, Pastor, when I was young, we once went to this, we once uh, 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 stole apples there in that shop or whatever, and I think the Lord has remembered that now he's punishing me. <laughs> People create all kinds of stories. They go back to their past just to go and look for a hook to, 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 to place this whole blame. It's because God is punishing me. And that has been said many a times. My sister, we've been praying for you, and this thing is not happening. It's time to confess now. And the poor woman says, yeah, let me think, let me think. Yeah, I think it's the hard thing that I did the other day. Oh, people, please. Those in Christ can go through sufferings. You know how I know that? You know how I know that? Because even Christ himself <laughs> suffered. So if, you, if, you're, if your leader, the one you are following, also went through suffering, you think you are better than him? He says, but here's the, here's the hope he gives us. He says, those sufferings cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed. Now, <clears throat> there are two ways you can look at that text. You can say those sufferings cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed when we go to heaven. There are texts that talk about that. That say, when we go to heaven, when we see all of this, you will look back and say, that suffering was nothing, you know, compared, compared to this. I ran the Combrace Marathon for the first time some time ago. I've done it almost uh, six, seven times. So I ran the Combrace. And the Combrace Marathon, you run from Deben to, those of you who know, Deben to Peter Marisberg. The Pyramids to Deben is about 90 kilometers in one day, and then you have to start in the morning, you finish in the evening, and within 12 hours, it must be done. When we started, it was about within 11 hours. If you hit 11 hours while still on the road, then they will, they, will, they will close. So you will go through all that suffering, cramps, all kinds of things. You are dizzy, you are tired. 
And then, but you want to go, you don't want to give up. And you think this is a Christian journey. No, this is just a race, man. So you rush. And you encourage yourself, don't give up. Jesus is with you. But Jesus is also with those who are not running. Why are you running? <laughs> so do all those things. And then, and then at the end, they give you a medal, small like this. You can't even sell that thing. It's like this. <laughs> then I look at this thing. I look at my battered body. Ah, but it's not worth it. But you know what Paul says? When you look at what you're going to get, you look at your battered body. You say, I'm going to do this thing again. I'm going there again. This is, this is not fair. What I've been given is far much more than the sufferings I've gone through. That's basically. That is true on that level. But now we need to be honest to the text. It also says that it cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, and then I take you to Romans 5, where Paul says we rejoice also in tribulation. And the reason we rejoice in tribulation, it is because we rejoice in tribulation because of what tribulations actually do in us. He says that in verse 4, he says, so verse 3, and not only that, we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Now, my, my submission to you is, beloved, that when we go through these sufferings, and Christ allows this suffering, he develops in us something that when you see it, you will say, I can go through that thing again. When you see what you have become, when you see how your faith has been made to shine, when you actually look at what you have actually become, at the transformation that has happened, and you say, wow. Now, some of us can even tell right now that you know what? You should have met me 10 years ago. What you see now, it's amazing. You see, God has a way of allowing us to go through some trials and go through painful. But even here, you pass and then you say, wow. The experience the knowledge. I know of people who, because of their sufferings, have written books that encourages the whole world. You see, what, what was revealed in them through that suffering is such a source of comfort and blessing to the whole world. They look back and say, wow, I've never been uh, pushed to a level where I can appreciate life as I do the suffering. Now, I can, I, I can give you another one. Okay, I'm going to link this one with, uh, let me link this one uh, as we close. Let me link with this one with, verse, with, with verse, uh, verse 28. I'm going to link it with verse 28 and then we're going to close. He says, all, and we know that all things work together for, for good to those who love God. All right? Let's end. Let's end on that note. Then we bring this thing home. Here's the point, beloved. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to combine these two texts that... The sufferings of the present moment cannot be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. In other words, when, when God ac- actually accomplishes what he wants to accomplish in you, you'll be so excited, you'll be so, you'll be so, you'll be so happy when you look at that. You'll even appreciate the fact that you went through suffering. And then he puts it nicely as he closes in 28. It says, all things, all things, including your sufferings and other things, work out for your good. They work together for good. You may not see it, but when you have gone through this and you are here, you will say, you know what? That thing was bad, but I thank God that I went through that. I'm going to give you stories that are true stories. The person lives his life the way he wants to live it. And then in this instance, he becomes HIV positive. Remember in those days when you were HIV positive, it was like the end. Today people live forever, quality life, because of antiretrovirals and care and whatever. But in the 90s, once you have that, it was like the end of your life. And people would look at you and say, yeah. And parents would say, you see, that's what happens. We keep telling you, you don't listen. God is punishing you. 
You know, I, I don't like it when people know what God is doing and what God is not doing. And one day God says, did I really do that? And you'll be surprised. So God is punishing. So you're also blaming yourself because you didn't listen. You're suffering from HIV and AIDS. You're going to die. That's painful. That's suffering. But that's the suffering because of your own foolishness, you can say. It's not like you're persecuted by HIV and AIDS. That's no persecution for, 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 for your faith. There's no faith there. That's why you're in that mess. <clears throat> Just to be clear on that. So don't glorify all your, your faults here. All right, so, so what do we do? And then God's grace reaches out. He opens your heart. And then for the first time, you see yourself from God's angle. And then you love what you see. And then God, through his grace, lifts you up and then gives you courage. Now, this is what happened. It's looking at a person like it's playing in the movie. And fast track, this person lives a life that is more impactful than the life of a preacher who's never gone through anything. He lives, he begins to live a life that is even more impactful than my life. When he speaks and he talks, you can say, what has God wrought here? What has God developed in this person? Now, here's the thing. HIV and AIDS, which was supposed to destroy this person, has made him even to be a better person. Not only that, through him, others are made to be better. So this person now is able to reach out to people who would never been able to, to reach to. He reached out to all his friends. His friends come to church and people are getting struck. He, he does that. And then you are tempted to say, we thank God for HIV. But you don't want to say that loud because that's not right. You, say, you know what? I think we thank God for that thing. I wish everybody must go through this so that they can, be, they can come back to their senses. But that's wrong to think like that. Are you with me? Because others would die. But, but this is what God does. He says, even in this thing that I saw hopeless, like end of life, when you have allowed grace to touch your heart, God can use even that which was meant to destroy you to be a platform for your ministry. He can use the very same thing. Now remember, when the devil threw that thing at you, he meant to destroy you. He meant to kill you. And when you open your heart to God's grace, God can, you know, you know what God does? So the, so the devil throws this thing at you to kill you. You open your heart to God, and God shines his grace to you. And then you say, God, what must I do with this thing? God says, don't throw it away. It has hurt you so much. We're not going to throw it away. We're going to use it to heal others. That kills me. You know how God works? It kills me. I, if I were God, I would throw all those things, throw these things there. He says, no, 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 no. Let's, let's run with it. We're going to use this very same thing for the healing of many. Now, I'm going to give you a text, and um, you probably will confess that probably my understanding of the text will be different from yours. Matthew, Matthew 11, 28, Christ says, Christ says, come unto me, and this is now my concluding statement, come unto me, and I will give you Rest. Learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. And then he says, Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is what? And my burden is what? Now, I've, I've always thought about that text. It's a simple text, but I've always thought about that text. I don't know what it means. You start off the journey, you come to Christ because you have a burden. Ne? So you come to Christ, you have a burden, you come to Christ with a burden. Because we are told then you leave your burden at the foot of the cross. Leave your burden at the There's even a song that says that. Leave your burden at the foot of the cross. So you take all this burden of having been raped. You leave it here. The burden of losing your father at an early age, you leave it here. The burden of whatever, you leave it here. So that when you go, you are now free. Am I right? You are now free. You are now light. Can I tell you? That it's not true what I've just told you. I'm sorry, some of you are beginning to say, amen. It's not true. It's, it looks like it's true, but it's fake. 
you know, fake it resembles true. But let me tell you what actually happens. Based on Matthew 11, 28, it says, Come unto me, all those of you who are heavy burdened, then I will give you rest. So you think of I will give you rest, that I will rest. But it says, take my yoke upon you. What are we doing with the yoke now? Because the yoke is an instrument to service. You, you, you actually need the yoke in order to pull the burden. Don't give me a yoke. I've left my burden there. It says, no, uh-uh. You come here, when you come to me, I'm going to give you, by giving you a yoke to, to carry your burden. <laughs> so life here has, okay, people, think about this thing. This thing is so true. Now, let's use a very painful experience. If you were raped and then you come to Christ, let me ask you, when you live and you walk with Christ, do, do you say, I say, hi, hi, how are you? He says, yeah. Aren't you the girl or oh, pastor? Me, I went to Christ. I don't even remember that. Does that happen? Does that really happen? Do, 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 you, rem do you forget what you went through because you come to Christ? No, that, that thing, I left it at the cross, pastor. Said, no, you carry it with you. But this time, it has not, it has ceased to be your bedding. It is Christ's bedding. So because he says, bring your burdens. I give you rest, I give you my yoke. And then he says, my burden now is light. So Christ puts his identity to your burden. He says, this is no longer your burden. It's my burden. I want you to carry it and let others know what I can do. Carrying that burden is going to be light. The very same burden of rape that was killing you here. Now you have the same burden of rape. Now you can stand in front of 18-year-olds. I want to tell you that when I was 16, I was raped. How come you are able to tell that story? Because rape is no longer your issue now. It has become God's burden. You can carry it. It's light. You can carry it. The very same thing that was killing you here. Here, you can carry it. You can talk about it. You can encourage people. Because God has assumed, God has actually claimed it as his. He says, now it's mine, it's my burden. And my burden Now we give and fake because even after we have left Christ, you still say, but why do I still think about what happened? It's because I'm not converted. No, you leave it to Christ. Let it be Christ's burden. Because we keep asking ourselves questions. I don't know about you. Lord, where were you? Why did you allow that thing to happen to me? I don't have an answer for that. God has an answer for that. That's why he has allocated a thousand years to help you with that one. So I don't have an answer for that. But I know that if you allow grace to touch you, Christ will assume that as his burden. Now both of you will ask the same question. Why were we raped, me and Christ? That's true. Do you know what happens when Paul persecutes the church? Jesus Christ does not say, why are you persecuting the church? He says, why are you persecuting me? So what happens now? That rape is no longer your rape. It's like they've also raped Christ. And if you rape Christ, you are in trouble. So I just walk. That's why I can tell what they did to me. But it's no longer my burden. It's Christ's burden. So, so, so but you can't then keep asking him, where were you? Where were you when this thing happened? He says, hey, 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 it's mine. I'm dealing with it. Walk. It's mine. Christ has assumed it. It's mine. Walk. I'm dealing with it. Now, it gets to a point when everything has been said and done that when God has given us his grace, let us be gracious to ourselves and, and forgive ourselves. Because we refuse to forgive ourselves. Even after 20 years, the person says, I'll never forgive myself for what I did. Never. I will never, Pastor. I said, why? God has forgiven you. Why don't you forgive yourself? No, no, I'll carry this burden. You know that story of a person who's in the van, in the, in the, in the van carrying, a, and carrying a burden? And they say, you must put it down. Don't put it down. Carry it. It's fine. It's your burden. Carry it. But Christ will make it light. All right? Now, learn to forgive yourself for having picked up that burden. Because once you pick it up, when you're not supposed to have picked it up, that burden could be HIV and AIDS. Once you pick it up, when you're supposed to pick it up, but once grace shines through your life, that burden you picked it up, I promise you, there's become Christ's burden. And anyone who does that to Christ 
will answer to Christ. And I'm going to say it to you, if you, as I stand here, you come, don't try it, don't try it because you might regret. If you come to me and you give me a big one, a fist, and I fall on the ground and I stand up with blood coming out, what I need to do with that example, what I need to do is to say, so we have decided to punch Christ now. <laughs> so how are you going to deal with that? Instead of saying, how could, how could Christ allow him to punch me? I says, now you have done something wrong. You know, but the punching could actually help me because I was trying to become very holier than others. I was trying, no, I wanted to follow the story. I was beginning to become self-complacent where I was feeling like, yeah, I've arrived. And your punch actually brought me into my senses. Lying there, I said, yeah, I think this thing has helped me. I need to do things differently. So your punch brings me closer to Christ. But let me tell you something. Christ will deal with for having brought me closer to him through your punch. Christ will deal with you for that punch that brought me closer to him. You will lose twice. You will lose because your punch will bring you closer to Christ, so you have lost. Because you thought I was going to leave the church. It has brought me closer to Christ, you have lost. And then Christ deals with you for having done that. You lose twice. So you leave things to Christ and say, what can I learn? So if a person has done something wrong, a person has hurt you deliberately or not, what can I learn from this? Because it says all things. So what good is going to come out of this one? How, how am I going to learn? Don't, don't throw things, your toys, and, and, and give up on life because of what you have, has happened to you. So I end with this one. And you have not heard this. It's going to be said here for the first time. Those who are in Christ, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Then how many of us are in Christ? Let me see your hands. Let me see the hands of those who are in Christ. Do I need to say something to you? Here it is. There is no condemnation. Amen. May God bless you. Amen? Yeah, I uh, uh, wish you could continue. Let's stand, song 633. When you all go to where? To heaven. I want to sing, and let's sing from our hearts and sing, 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 and praise God uh, as we come to the close. Song 633.
Thank you, dear Father. Indeed, when we go to heaven, one day when we are in your presence, what a joy it will be. But Lord, we can experience that joy even here on earth as we allow your grace to shine through us. But even as we go through difficulties in this planet, on this planet, we can be able to sing the song of Zion in a strange land because, Lord, you are with us or you said you would never leave us nor forsake us. And I pray for some of us who may be standing here, Lord, with doubts in their minds because of what they are going through. We remember them, Lord, in our prayers that you may, lose, you may use their experience as a platform for their ministry, as a content for their testimony. And that through those challenges, they may not only be blessed, but they can be a blessing to our society, to this world. And where, Lord, we may be suffering from the wrongs that we ourselves have, have committed because of our stubbornness, teach us, Lord, in your love and in your mercy that we may learn to be strong and learn to be vigilant. Bless us all now, dear Father. We look forward to the time that has been set aside